Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Songo Didiza. I am part of the Convocation Exco here at the university. I also represent the Convocation Exco within the Honorary Degrees um, Committee. I'm quite excited to welcome you all to tonight's session, which promises to be a quite thrilling um, discussion on the circular economy and its impact on business models um, within our global economy. And taking us into tonight's session, we've got an expert panel of speakers within the circular economy. I would like to um, particularly welcome our moderator who's going to be hosting all these experts, Professor Helen Du, Professor Helen Du, sorry, from the School of Business Sciences. 
as you know, um, these discussions are very important to the university, particularly as we're leading up to the 100 year celebrations. And we're quite excited about that as a university. And it's quite important that as a university, we bring in all the thinkers, the, the doers, the thought leaders that are within the organizations, but also most importantly, our alumni. And alumni, as we all know, over 106,000 of you around the world. And particularly tonight, we're quite excited that you'll be joining us for the circular economy discussion. So in joining us the discussion, I'd like to welcome Professor Helen Durr, who's going to be facilitating tonight's session, which is about one hour and 30 minutes long. For those that are interested in asking questions, please pop, pop them through into the chat box. We will be able to answer them during the Q&A part of the session. Please note that tonight's session will be recorded. So um, for those that don't get enough time to participate in the session, um, we'll send through a recorded session of the, of the event. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my facilitator for this evening, Professor Helen Durr, who heads up the School of Business Sciences within the university. Thanks everyone. Really a pleasure to have you to talk on this important topic, circular economy. I am the head of School of Business Sciences and I'm participating and facilitating this um, talks because uh, circular economy is something that is um, dear to my heart. And um, I'm from Cameroon. I went home one time and they asked me if I have to become a minister, which minister, which portfolio. And I told them I would want to become an environmental minister because I see what all of our actions and consumption are doing to the environment. Personally, I've I started doing my own little bit in terms of circular economy, washing all the plastic bags and reusing them because I don't want the many plastic bags that we find in the environment to the extent where I've put a stop clock for my sons so they don't shower for more than five minutes. <laughs> so it's something that is very important to me. And I had to take it further to um, start studying um, uh, things that relate to circular economy to the extent where we wrote a proposal for funding for a European Commission funding for about $6 million uh, with some colleagues in Germany, Belgium, Italy, Nigeria. We were not fortunate to get the funding, but we are still fostering the um, research and training in, in the area of a circular economy. On the VIT space, we are actually collaborating with colleagues in the UK and Nigeria, Kenya to advance ideas and training and, and to um, advance the practice of circular economy. And we are doing this in two years. We have uh, collaborated with these colleagues and we want to start conducting research. We have formed a research group, the African Circular Economy Research Group. And we were fortunate to get funding from the British Council. And that would, we would use that particular research group to conduct interdisciplinary research that would foster the, uh, the theory and, and practice of circular economy. And we have another group, actually, we are looking at how we can develop a curriculum. We are working, we want to work with young people. You guys know when young people believe in something, they will do their best that everybody complies. So we are looking at a situation where we we'll develop a curriculum for young entrepreneurs, for businesses, and even for students, and to engage other young people to, uh, look at how we can um, uh, implement the three goals of circular economy, which is uh, reuse, recycle, and refurbish. So that would be great if we can invite the young people. But I will stop talking about myself and I would invite um, our speakers. And I looked at their CV, quite amazing. And all of them are talking into areas of circular economy and resource management. So our first speaker um, is, um, I'll just go to the person's, um, I'll give a brief in introduction of the person. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Kirsten Burns, and he is a circular economy analyst in the Green Cape Circular Economy Program with a focus on circular plastics economy in South Africa. 
secondary construction materials from construction and demolition waste and the integration of the informal and formal waste sectors in South Africa. Kenston has a background in environmental science and chemistry, including a PhD focusing on the biogeochemistry of wetland system in natural settings. Let us um, welcome or appreciate um, Dr. Benz and uh, we'll give her the opportunity to talk now. Thank you very much, Prof. Henry. It's um, very exciting for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Songo and Pervy. It's a pleasure to present today on a topic which is also close to my heart, Prof. Henry. So the circular economy and the future, and what does this mean for Africa? What does this mean for South Africa? The three R's of the circular economy that I get most excited about are restorative, regenerative, and resilient as descriptions of the circular economy. I lead the South African Plastics Pact, which is currently the largest circular economy initiative in South Africa, and we're convening business members and supporting members across the plastic value chain to drive a circular economy for plastics in South Africa. So my first question for us today is why the circular economy? And according to Mark Bernabe of the Reserve Bank of Australia, a board member, the circular economy not only represents a trillion dollar economic opportunity globally, but is a key part of the global solution to tackle plastic waste, address climate change, and restore the health of ecosystems. Keith Tufi, Managing Director of City, stresses that a circular economy is key to building an economic system that is viable in the long run, in which value is created and maintained rather than extracted and wasted, and the same sentiment is reiterated by Jean-Philippe Penin of Group Renal, VP Strategic Environmental Planning. The circular economy offers significant opportunities for business to generate long-term value. Now, these are quotes from major players in the global environment, but then we have to ask, these are often um, the markets where these uh, groups are predominant, could be seen as highly developed economies, but what does that mean for Africa? What does that mean for South Africa? Well, the Accenture Strategy and National Business Initiative of South Africa in 2016 published a report called Reimagining Africa's Future, in which they highlight a $350 billion opportunity for sustainable business. Now, this encompasses both extra revenue and the potential for cost savings. So where exactly and what exactly are these opportunities that this group identified in their report. So the first is an estimated $186 billion opportunity in new consumption. So Africa is the fastest growing consumer base in terms of consumption levels. Demand is rapidly rising and there is the unique opportunity in the African context to redesign our services and materials in a way which values the resources that we have circulates them in the economy and includes our people in the design of that economy. Secondly, around a $43 billion annual opportunity in, create, in creating collaborative operating models. And key to this aspect is addressing the systemic development challenges that many that Africa faces as a whole in terms of income and resource inequality. And here we really emphasize local and inclusive value chains. This is a key aspect to a circular economy where we really look at the local supply of resources, the circulating of those resources at high value in a very limited geographical environment to retain the economic value, the income opportunities for that local area. Thirdly, $84 billion in driving resource efficiencies. So here again, emphasizing circular business models the use of renewable energy of, of renewable resources, and then also accessible material flows that are able to move across sectors. And this is very important in creating a circular economy. No longer are we in our industrial silos. We need to consider the economy as a whole. And then four, $37 billion opportunity in building trust through transparency. So this means implementing very high standards across the value chain for trust and accountability. And I think we'd all agree that it's necessary to attract investors and give them comfort in terms of the 
um, high standards of the supply chain of the products and services on offer, and that also sees improvements in productivity. And we have some speakers who will focus on technological developments, and there's been some excellent examples through Africa of innovative digital platforms which allow this trust to be built through the tracking of materials through the supply chain that are able to link, for example, informal sector players or SMEs to much larger markets, tracking materials, and then with also social and environmental benefits. So we've been talking about the, the circular economy and there are many references to a circular economy, but what does it really mean in practice? So currently where we sit is largely a linear economy. Um, so we have a material supply chain, design and manufacturing, distribution and use and end of first life with a very quick sort of flow through or yeah, output of our economy. So this take make waste um, society has resulted in some very negative economic, environmental and social impacts. So what is a circular economy? A circular economy is really a system redesign. So we don't start with the material supply chain. We start by rethinking the material resources within our economy and the methods of extraction. So, and when we rethink those material sources and methods of extraction, we have the ultimate purpose for that product and service and also the end of the first life of that product. And we're thinking about the potential for multiple life cycles and looping. So this is emphasizing that point. So within the material supply chain design and manufacturing um, sections of the economy, we look to extend use cycles, we look to add as many additional use cycles as possible, and we look to minimize the impact of the end of first life, and in fact we design for multiple lives. We can also then look at changing utilization patterns, and this is something Prof Helen referenced in her intro. So we can look at new business models like uh, reuse models, refill models, for example, where you might take your container back to your shop multiple times to refill with dishwashing liquid or noodles. So whatever product, uh, so looking at that as a, a potential circular economy business model. Also key in a circular economy is again a focus on consumption. The way we're currently consuming um, resources on the planet it's as if we have the mindset of an infinite resource supply. It's very clear that this is not true. We've already broken to pushing many planetary boundaries. So we need to look at reduction of consumption and we need to look at replacement of certain raw materials with materials that are more likely to be cycled in our economy for economic value and for further income opportunities within a, within a circular economy. Very key, I've mentioned looping of materials quite often. Very key are these additional loop cycles of our resources where we retain their value. With the closer the looping, so you can see that repair loop where the product is maintained very much as it was first designed and delivered to the first customer. So we can think of a washing machine where the, the, the washing machine is designed to be easily repaired in a very local context. And then it can be quickly returned to its use um, as a product. We can think of reuse. I've already given an example of a couple of reuse models. We can think of remanufacturing. And this is when in the upstream part of the value chain, we design in a modular way. This can be buildings, this can be cell phones. When at the end of first life of that building or cell phone, components or modules of those um, products can be um, returned and reassembled in a different configuration. Then finally, once our materials are, are no longer able to be cycled through some of the more high value loops that you see on screen, we can then break it down to components like for plastic packaging, we can flake it or pellet it, and then it can be re-entered as a raw material back into the supply chain to be manufactured into something else. So that, that's the range and scope of the circular economy relating to materials that I'll be addressing. But where are we in South Africa? We've had a recent um, fascinating and groundbreaking study by Van Blotnitz and colleagues, which looks at material flow analyses, a material flow analysis, analysis of the South African economy. I clearly haven't had enough coffee today. 
So where are we? It's no surprise to everyone on the call that our economy is dominated by extractive industry with a focus on non-renewable resources. And we have very limited beneficiation of our natural resources in South Africa. This means that our economy has a high loss of resources with associated high greenhouse gas emissions. Our design and manufacturing or the manufacturing sector is largely dependent on fossil fuel energies and in, or energy and in general in our economy, we design for one life. So our products, whether they designed to last a few days, a few months, a number of years, in general, our design approach is for one life. We don't design for multiple life cycles. So in essence, we are designing for landfill. We have limited stocks built up in our economy with rapid use and disposal of many resources. This means we have high wastage and not only do we have high wastage, but we have a loss of resources in handling those wastes and storing them and treating them. There is some recycling in our economy currently. Uh, you can see that it's quite a small arrow and um, purposely designed. So the socioeconomic recycling refers to what might be called technical nutrients. So these are, could be metals, plastics, um, rubble or, or aggregate stone in our economy and then at, at about 2% recycling rate. And then our ecologically, ecologically, ecological cycling is slightly higher at 5%. And this refers to the biological nutrients that are then returned to the natural environment. So if we go on, we've spoken of new consumption opportunities and the $186 billion opportunity possible in Africa. So where does this sit? What does this look like? So the first can be termed circular supplies. So this is where we can think renewable resources, renewable energy, reuse of water, and another um, fascinating topic of research and application is industrial symbiosis. So where the underutilized resources of one company can become resources for another company. This might look like waste streams from company A, and um, it might look like unused warehouse space, um, empty trucks in, the, in terms of logistics. And we have an example of an industrial symbiosis system in the Western Cape Gauteng and KZN. And there's a facilitated exchange between companies. The Western Cape Industrial Symbiosis Program has realized over five years more than 120 million rands worth of additional revenue, cost savings, and investment due to this brokering of exchanges and synergies between different companies. Then we can think of product life extension. So you could think of maybe there are examples globally of electronics and electrical goods um, repair hubs where you can take your product to that repair hub. It's a manned hub. So you can be guided through the repair of your product and then you're able to then um, reuse it. So you extend the life of your product. You don't um, use a cell phone for two years, put that one in the e-waste recycling and get the next one. But there's, there's more accessibility to your product itself for you to be able to repair it. Then sharing platforms. Uber is the, the easiest um, sharing platform. And again, uh, just, it, it, talks to dematerialization of our economy. So we spoke about the need to reduce consumption. So one car can be an effective mode of transport for many people on something like an Uber platform. And there are many examples of such um, circular economy business models. Um, resource recovery, then we, we have a, a local South African company which can divert um, in the Western Cape, around 100 tons of organic waste from landfill per day. It's a black soldier fly farming company. The larvae feed off that organic waste and then at the, they are ground up and are sold as a high quality animal feed. And this is replacing fish meal and therefore reducing the burden on our fish stocks. And then finally, a product as a service. And one of the best examples of this globally is Philips which sells, in some context, sells lighting as a service. So as a company receiving that service, you pay a certain amount per month. You don't have to change light bulbs or check light fittings, anything related to the practicalities of your lighting. Philips, as your service provider, 
commit to maintain your lighting to the standard at which you agreed upon. So there's a number of different opportunities within a circular economy. And I think you can see just from the material usage. So we've emphasized that there's a high wastage of our resources in the South African economy. And it would look much, very similar in other African countries that just the, the, the material available as resources, which can be recycled through our economy, there's a large amount of resource available. This translates into new business models, some of which examples of which I've given you. This translates into new income opportunities. So we have much to explore and design into our economy. I'm going to end with an example of a collaborative approach to create a circular economy for plastics in South Africa. We are focused on plastics packaging. So as mentioned, Green Cape and I lead the South African Plastics Pact. We have 23 business members across the plastics value chain. Um, and you can see our current members on screen. We also have key supporting members who have national influence and are able to change the environment and the landscape to enable a circular economy for plastics in South Africa. And as a collaborative, so it, it was mentioned up front as well, that in designing a circular economy, we are aiming for system change. It's not something any one organization, any one sector can achieve on their own. And so together as a collaborative, we are aiming at ambitious time-bound targets. So by 2025, we look to eliminate unnecessary and problematic packaging. Um, so this is plastic packaging on the market, which has a very limited chance of being cycled through our economy. And this looks like additional business models. This looks like additional income opportunities. And it's important to note there's growing body of evidence globally across developed and developing country settings that a circular economy provides more income opportunities, is more people inclusive, depending on your approach to design the circular economy than the traditional linear economy system, which we are currently in. So uh, under elimination, there's new business models that could look at innovation and product. They could look at um, the new business models in terms of reuse or refill stations in terms of plastic that would um, alternative materials as another potential business model under our target one. Target two, we look at 100% of plastic packaging under the authority of our members to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. So the reusable business opportunity retains that material at a very high value, making it much more likely to be cycled multiple times through our economy. In terms of recyclable packaging, our members are working to ensure that the feedstock to our recycling industry, that there's more available, it's more accessible, and it's easier to recycle in the South African context. Compostable materials, there's definitely a place for truly compostable materials. Just a warning, many of the materials on the market labeled compostable we find are not actually compostable in the current setting and may actually be detrimental. But compostable materials where there are systems to collect and treat it, um, there are some low hanging fruits in terms of application which we need to explore as a country. Target three is an improved increased recycling rate, which we have to collaborate beyond ourselves. It's not something we can achieve as the Plastics Pack Collaborative. And to drive that recycling rate, we really do need target four. So not only are our members looking at the supply of materials into a circular economy for plastics, but they themselves who specify, the brand owners and retailers in particular, who put that recyclable packaging on the market they need to be part of the solution by then specifying recycled content back into their packaging, which is possible for many packaging formats. And we look at a 30% average recycled content across all plastic packaging. So I just wanted to end with a, a case study of a very specific initiative integrating across business, industry, academia. We have UJ as our first academic member to really drive a circular economy for plastics in South Africa. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for your time. I look forward to the discussions. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Christine, for such rich and informative presentation. 
indeed Africa has the resources that we can discover and I'm doubting whether we really need to discover them because we have lots of wind and sunlight and I used to think God sat in Port Elizabeth and developed the wind that we can use. So I would open the floor for questions and um, Dongo, do we have some questions for Kirsten? No questions yet. I'm looking at the chat box. I've just nudged everybody to 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 ask the questions, but I think they're still mulling in the in, in their minds. So let's just give them some time. Yes, it's like we there are some on the chat. I got some in the chat. Let me see. Um, let me see which one. One of it is how do you see the role of technology in the fast tracking secular economy based business models in our society? Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the questions. Kirsten, are you getting the question? We'll just take two or three of them. So the first, how okay. do you see the role of technology in fast tracking secular economy based business models in our society? Then the other mm -hmm. one, how how do you think the newly gazetted extended producer responsibility regulations impact the secular economy in South Africa? Did you get that one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at, oh, this one is a long one, but let's take the two first questions first. Okay, great. Thanks, Prof. Helen. I'm going to start with the extended producer responsibility regulations. So the new EPR re regulations make extended producer responsibility mandatory. I'm going to focus particularly on the packaging space. So for packaging placed on the market, the South African market, it's now mandatory for those producers, which includes the packaging manufacturers, it includes the retailers and the brand owners. And to take responsibility for their packaging throughout the life cycle of that product. And in terms of, of EPR legislation, so it'll come into, it, it came into effect on the 5th of May this year, and the extended producer responsibility plans need to be submitted in November for approval and full implementation of the plans or the, the, the initiation of the, of the plans on the 1st of January 2022. So in terms of our EPR regulations, I was thrilled to see that one of the objectives of our regulations is to drive circular economy initiatives in South Africa. This is unusual across EPR regulations globally. EPR traditionally looks at the end of life only, requiring producers to not just consider their responsibility up until the use phase, but to also provide sufficient funding for the recovery and recycling of those materials back into products. Our particular regulations take it even further and move into the demand side. So move into a, a very effective mechanism to drive our recycling rate, which has stagnated and even decreased slightly over the past few years in the plastics anyway, by specifying recycled content targets for some of the materials. Now we need to increase those, we need to up the ambition there. But for, in the plastic space, most of our plastics materials, the recycling rate is lagging because we're not including the plastic back into products. So to really drive that economy, we need to create the pull by specifying um, recycled content back into our products and our packaging. Um, and the packaging as a closed loop recycling creates a very resilient market. So uh, that is very important. There's big potential in our EPR regulations. We do have a lot of work to do. The mandatory system is quite an increase in scope from the voluntary system. And um, th there's, there's much discussion, brainstorming, and um, high level thinking going on at the moment to develop those EPR plans. It's not gonna be perfect in the first year, but we need to aim for continuous improvement. I think on the, the technology question, I'm probably not the best placed person to speak. But what I would like to say is for many of the more developed, mature economies um, globally, there has been a 4IR focus on implementation of circular economy. I would suggest in the African context that a 4IR approach, for example, in manufacturing, um, 
even if you can think of in the plastics to replace people with sorting machines is not the way we, we need to be focusing in, in Africa. There are many other amazing spaces for technological development, but we need to be designing, specifically designing people into our economy. Where we've seen the usefulness of applications in a circular economy space is in linking informal sector SMEs to a, a bigger supply chain, linking them to some of the bigger um, customers on the planet. So that has been very helpful. It's also been useful in providing financial records for some SMEs and informal sector who struggle to access resources because of that lack. And also created that accountability that the Accenture report highlighted as the last economic opportunity where um, the, the system is more transparent. There are obviously very strict protections over who can see what information. But for example, in the informal waste picker space or reclaimer space, the, it, it can be tracked what buyback centers are paying to the informal sector. So we can try and weed out some of the oppressive relationships that buyback centers can have with their collectors. Okay. Thank you. And I just have one last question in the chat. Someone is asking what support you have from the corporate uh, polluters, as this is well and good, but we need the companies responsible for producing the plastic to support you. Are you getting the support in any way? Um, agreed. Sorry, I don't know if you can see my screen. I'm just going to bring up, these are the current members in our supply chain. So these are members who've realized that their own plastic packaging that is put on the market is currently not in general being circulated and there needs to be bold, dramatic action to do so. So these are our current membership. We are signing members all the time. And the idea is that I think currently we have about an estimated 26% of the plastic packaging placed on the market in South Africa is in our membership. Um, the UK Plastics Pact has 85 to 90% of the plastic packaging placed on the market in the UK. So therefore the impact of the initiatives through the UK Plastics Pact and their influence in guiding policy and regulation um, is quite impactful. So that is what we're aiming at, completely agreed. We do need large scale buy-in. And what we hope is that as we publish documents like we published our roadmap, we published our phase one list of problematic and unnecessary plastic that our members have committed to phase out. We're about to publish the quick wins of recycled content back into our packaging. And end of this month, we're publishing our first baseline report. We're hoping that these interventions we're putting in place, we're hoping that the um, truthful and honest reporting on where we are in terms of cycling our packaging will inspire companies and organizations far beyond our plastics pack membership. Okay, thank you. I'm surprised that we don't have a food lovers uh, shop here, retailers, because they are using the paper bags already. And I would so love the others to start using the paper bags to yeah for, for customers to wrap their yes. their, their their products. Yes. Okay. And um, Megna just notes in the chat okay. um, from PepsiCo. PepsiCo is our newest member. We're about to confirm everything. So Megna, yes, PepsiCo, um, you are definitely a friend. Thank you. Okay, thanks so very much. And um, I we would go on to our next uh, presenter and um, that is uh, Dean Cunningham, and he holds a directorships in many organizations. I actually spent some time counting them. There were more than eight where he is a director. And over the years, Dean's experience has focused on resources with a strong understanding of logistics, construction, and manufacturing. Within the sector, he has gained experience in preparing companies for disinvestment listing, restructuring and expansion. He has, he also has experience in marketing and advertising, corporate strategy and positioning, branding, team building, risk management, stakeholder management, finance, budgeting, procurement, organization and, and organizational and cultural change. When a CEO in a mining company in the Middle East, Dean was recognized in the country's top 
100 CEO list in 2017. Dean, you are welcome and thanks for accepting to uh, provide us with your presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks, Prof. Um, let me put up the presentation. Uh, give me two seconds. Um, there you go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I just want, firstly wanted to say to Christine, that was a great presentation um, and there's no doubt that there is a number of huge opportunities that exist in the South African and the African market. And probably that's where we are focusing most of our time and attention at the, at the moment. But let me take you through my presentation. Um, as a ex vits mining engineer, way back in 1985, I, I'm gonna start off just having a look at the resources sector. Um, and where I anticipate that to go. Um, fairly different to what the current thinking is in the market. So let me just change the slide. Oh, there we go. You've said that bits and pieces. And so I've, we've really changed our focus to now investing in the circular economy. And so I'll also show you some of the things that we're doing um, and we also trying to build a relationship with VITS with regards to a number of a, a one particular initiative with regards to the informal sector. Um, our focus is really about creating jobs um, with an economy that's got about 40% unemployment. So what are types of waste do we have? We have e-waste, paper, plastic, glass, metal and organic. Um, and each of these has a different uh, focus and generally companies are broken up into acquiring different parts of these or all of them. Um, and we, as I will talk to just now, have just acquired a company that involve, is involved in the collection of all of this. And I'll take you through where we take it. Um, as part of our strategy of turning waste uh, into something that can be used um, in the long term. So if I look at the current landscape um, now in the, in the circular economy, there is a significant portion associated to the mining industry. Um, and that's mining, processing, and then producing the raw materials. Um, there was a study done in, in um, Japan um, with regards to Tokyo, um, and through the utilization of algorithms, um, they worked out on an annual basis the number of cell phones, cars, um, fridges, white goods, that would come into the market um, and be replaced. And as a consequence of that, um, the amount of on-surface material um, that was available was significant, far further than they originally anticipated. So that is a process called scrapping. And we'll go through um, the next slide. So, we anticipate that from a mining perspective, which is a positive and a negative from an African perspective, because as the speaker earlier um, described, uh, one of the things that we don't do is do any beneficiation and we allow our products to exit the country as a raw material and don't add value to it. And probably there's one or two materials that uh, we can benefit still from in, in the future, but largely there is a lot of on-surface um, material that can be turned from, instead of going mining, will be turned through the process of scrapping and that will fit into that process and that can be turned over on an ongoing basis. And here again, I, I pretend to, I, I look specifically at the um, mining sector. Um, and the, the, we'll talk about and have a look at a case study of a company called Scan Metals, 
um, which is in the Scandinavian countries um, at the end of this presentation. And I'll just take you through what they do and the impact of that and, and how landfill sites have actually disappeared and everything is now recovered uh, through a number of processes. And I'll talk about that just now. So if you look at, from a commodity perspective, since 1840 to 2005, and it's probably even got less, all the high quality commodity groups um, from a grade perspective and the quality of the resources have declined and they've declined quite significantly. And if you're a miner and you go uh, and take a platinum mine as an example, it's gonna cost you a couple of billion dollars to build and operate that entity. And it's gonna take you about eight years to build it. And then it's gonna take you about another five or six years to start recovering and getting a revenue generation and returning back from an investment perspective. Whereas from a scrapping perspective, you can spend in the order of a couple of a hundred million dollars and start recovering the same commodities on surface, which reduces your risk. Um, so from a scrapping versus a mining perspective, it's, it, it is my personal opinion that in the longer term that there's going to be a larger proportion of the supply demand is going to be um, from a scrapping perspective. And we'll talk about percentages of things like uh, iron or, I mean, iron, uh, steel and copper later. Um, and technology has improved quite sufficiently and over the last couple of weeks, we've seen one of the large South African entities, uh, Sabania, which is uh, operations both here in South Africa and in the US, now start moving into the scrapping market and particularly on the platinum side. Um, and it's particularly with regards to AutoCATs, um, recovering those and then producing PGMs out of that. And it's also said that in some of the highways in Germany, that the grades, um, and that's the platinum contained in the autobahns, is higher than some of the South African mining operations. And it's easier to go and pick up the tar, recover the, the PGMs, and then put new tar down. Um, so we've talked about algorithms. And so from a Japanese perspective, what they did is they worked out each year how much was going to come out. Um, they then put scrapping facilities for the whole of Tokyo together. And on an annual basis, they now recover this and put these metals, um, both precious and non-precious, back into the economy, which then requires them to import or buy freshly new mine products um, and reduce that quite significantly. Um, and as this graph has shown, in, as I said earlier, all the high-grade projects have disappeared. And the impact of that is that as you get into the lower grades, you start having a cost implication. Um, and the impact of that is that it goes through to the consumer and eventually this will just become in, so expensive that it will not happen any further. I mean, the South African gold mining industry goes uh, is now at 5,000 meters below ground. Um, and it's just becoming so cost sensitive that, uh, the, that the South African gold industry has gone from about to a thousand tons per annum to less than 60 tons per annum. So the gold industry here is relatively finished. So in my opinion, there are two types of commodities. Um, there's what I call non-recoverable. Um, and that's the likes of limestone and lime, the gypsums and the dolomites, two of which are used in the steel industry. And they're used to consume the contaminates in the iron and to make high quality steel. And one looks at the global economy and sees the consumption of, of steel as an indication of economic activity. Um, 40, 50 years ago, steel demand in China was around 20 to 25 kilograms per capita. It's currently sitting at now 500. And a country like India is uh, sitting 
Um, at around 80, it was about 20 kilograms per capita about four or five years ago, and they anticipate over the next 10 years to uh, go to around 400 kilograms per capita. So you can actually understand the level of demand for steel in the market, which is scrappable. Um, and a lot of African countries have just banned the export of scrap um, so that it can be consumed internally. And there's a process to do that. And in the gypsum side, you once you put gypsum into cement, you can't go and recover it. And there's normally a, a, con a consumption of two tons of, of cement to one ton of steel. So you can work that out. So the big scrappable ones are the steel side, um, copper. Um, we've often noticed that power goes down in and around Johannesburg, um, I mean, in South Africa, and that's a consequence of people stealing um, the cables and then melting down the copper and selling it. Um, and then there's the likes of nickel and there's a, a whole bunch of other ones. So, you know, these things are, are all scrappable and are now starting to make up quite a considerable uh, um, part of the supply demand balance. Um, this is a presentation that I did when I was in the Middle East um, running a fairly large um, industrial minerals business. And from Bloomberg's iron ore, iron was being recovered up to 40%. And I know that that's gone over 55 at this stage and copper was recovered around 38%. So to me, the, when one has a look at the primary supply from a mining perspective, there's going to be a significant move towards the secondary supplies and the scrapping. Um, and quite, in, quite interest, interestingly, um, the this, this scrapping environment is a low risk environment relative to a high risk long term return, um, if at all, for the mining sector. And a couple of good examples um, of this is the um, recovery of platinum. So one ton of platinum ore produces uh, a ring. Um, and if you go and recover four auto catalysts, you can produce the same ring, um, but the costing structure of the one ton re uh, recovered from a mining perspective is significantly higher than that of four recovering four water catalysts on surface. Um, and then the scrapping process, you take a car, you dismantle it, uh, you turn it into iron, the aluminum, the copper, other um, bits and pieces and catalysts. And then you come up with a range of different products that you come through. So, the two things that we've looked at um, in our business model um, in moving away from mining is that we have just acquired a significant portion of a company called FMP uh, and it recovers um, brass, stainless steel cans, etc., plus plastic uh, paper, glass, um, and all of these from the from the informal sector and a little bit in particular the cannings um, and containers from some of the producers where they overrun on the number of cans and then we crush and, and uh, recycle those and, and sell them back to the industry. Um, and then today we just acquired DMS powders. Um, it's been a long, hard day of getting that done. And that basically takes uh, scrap uh, iron with a uh, high-grade uh, ferrous silica. Um, it combines the two um, and makes what they call fessy, which is utilized in the mining industry to recover minerals from once they have been through the processing uh, and grinding uh, facility, and then they they are then refined and recovered. Now, as you as you look at that picture, you see that this is a high temperature furnace environment, and one of the things that we are in the process of looking at in the next couple of months will be then to capture the heat and the emissions that come out of that, um, and use that to be passed through what we call an algin plant and recover and produce electricity and not put uh, the uh, 
uh, flue gas into the into the uh, environment, and then turn that back into energy, which would then be used for our um, running of our administration environment and saving us a lot more on power. And then we're looking at the whole um, renewable side um, as far as uh, solar is concerned, wind. Wind up here in Johannesburg, Moton is not that fantastic. Um, we were part of uh, a, a group that put together the wind farm in uh, PE. And as Prof indicated at, right at the beginning of the presentation, um, that is just an amazing environment. And uh, utilization from a banking perspective was put at about 28. Um, and we found that subsequent to that, that that thing paid itself back over three years instead of eight, because the, the utilization due to wind was above 35%. Um, so I think that you're going to see a significant greater growth in wind um, in the PE environment, because the, the quality of that wind resource is quite significant. Then... How do we collect here in South Africa? And this is in particular my, in reference to FMP, is that we have a very big informal settlement, uh, informal sector that does this. Um, and I think all of us have noticed that early in the morning, these guys are out on the street, um, coming in at four or five o'clock in the morning and going through our bins. Um, or if you're like us, we separate paper, glass, and plastic and put it out and the guys come and fetch it early on a Sunday evening because our collection is on a Monday. Um, and I've noticed over the last two to three years that our two bins are now down to half a bin um, just because we are recycling. And these guys do a great job, and I know that... Uh, uh, we have FMP and uh, Bits have been chatting about doing some sort of a uh, design um, with some of the uh, engineering um, teams efforts to design a cart and a pool thing um, that is significantly better than currently what they use. The, the gentleman in the middle here pulling, I mean, that is basically an ironing board uh, leg and they've got a door and then they go and get some wheels uh, from the trolleys that you find at Checkers and at Woolworths and they put them on and that's how they get around and we're going to look at that. Um, they take that to a number of collection sites, FMP. We have 13 sites across the south, southern portion of Johannesburg and on a daily basis we spend in and around 30, I mean, 3 million Rand a day, um, bringing uh, this, paying for this material that has been collected by these guys who I've got the hugest amount of respect for. Um, they make in the order of 50 to 60 Rand a day. And as the first speaker discussed, one of the things is that in some instances, they are not paid um, the sufficient amount, and we need to try and, and make sure that they get paid correctly. Uh, we believe we're paying uh, in the right uh, amounts. Um, these guys are work hard. They're very trustworthy. Um, when they come to our various collection sites, they each of them will collect paper or plastic. Um, they don't put water in the bottles to make it heavier. They are just absolutely superb at what they do. And I have a huge amount of respect. We, and they bring in paper, they bring in glass. And a company like Consul, every bit of glass that we produce, um, they buy up and then they recycle it, crush it um, in the different colors. I think you've got a brown, a green, and then a white. And they recycle that. And in the cardboard, and prior to um, the pandemic, um, the demand for tissue paper, for toilet paper, was absolutely massive because I think we all ran to the shops to try and buy it. Um, and that's still in a significant demand. Probably an area that we don't think about, but is the tires in the bottom left here. Um, when we've finished with our tires on our car, 
um, there are hectares and hectares of tires just sitting there looking for a solution. Um, there is a number of uh, solutions that include pelletizing, um, which is the, as shown in the, in the hands here, and they then mix it um, with the tarring on roads and on sports tracks. Um, it's used for garden, uh, garden furniture. I think that the flamingo is certainly something I wouldn't want to put in the garden, but there are a number of people that would do. Um, and then they also use it for gravel in the garden because it, it uh, helps absorb the water. But this is probably one of the biggest unlooked at environments and people are starting to use it to, um, to re do retaining walls, um, swings and all of these things. But the, the amount of uh, tires and that are available to put through a processing for some sort of process to get rid of them is significant. And then if you go and have a look on some of the US websites, you'll see um, it, it's almost like the Grand Canyon that, of tires. So that's, that's a potential area that we're looking at to try and find some way of uh, turning that into a value stream in the long term. Um, this is uh, a interesting um, project. Um, this is what they call an algin plant. It uh, historically, as I said earlier, captured um, the furnace off gas and generated around 18 megawatts of power. Um, it has a capacity of around 50 megawatts. And one of the technologies that is globally available and is in operation around the world, and we'll talk about this in our uh, case study of the uh, scan uh, metals in uh, the Scandinavian countries, is that if you put on a front end on this of waste, um, and I'm talking about tire, I mean, plastic, uh, cardboard, um, and other various bits and pieces, they all have a calorific value that then generates energy and that gas is then captured as a synthetic gas and then can be put through a facility like this. Um, and this is the metal alloys complex in Mayotin where DMS is. And this is one of the things that we're looking at acquiring as well. Um, and on the basis of that generate up to 50 megawatts. There is no waste recycling in that area. Um, so we would try and look at building a facility on site. And then the other thing with uh, metal alloys is they have a significant uh, waste dump um, of about eight to 9 million tons, which has a significant environmental uh, um, cost to it. Um, in the order of several hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and we've gone through a process of looking at that and coming up with a solution to take that magnesium, uh, manganese slag and converting it into electrolytic manganese um, with about 25% of that, which is going to be used in the EV market. Um, you then also produce a synthetic gypsum uh, and that is used in cement and there's no CO2 um, uh, coming off cement. So when you produce cement, cement is one of probably the, uh, is a very large CO2 producer. Uh, it generates it when it cools down. So that, and then the byproducts that are then used for, for infilling and roads and stuff like that. So this is, probably something that you are going to start seeing a lot of with a whole lot of South African uh, companies putting these types of facilities in place, putting these types of uh, energy generators in place. And as we know, government has just upped the amount of energy and people in their companies in their private capacity can do to 100 megawatts. Um, and that would then release the reliance on uh, uh, the likes of coal for our coal-fired power stations. The unfortunate part, and again, I refer to back to one of the earlier speakers, uh, was that 
we are still going to unfortunately have to continue to run a base load um, in South Africa of coal um, because the Cassilia and the um, I can't remember the other name of the, the two new coal-fired power stations that we bought. Um, we have debt of some $350 billion. So Eskom has to pay for that. And the only way that I pay for that is to actually continue generating uh, energy through coal environment. But I think in the long term, you're going to see an increase in renewables and a decline on the coal-based um, coal-fired power stations, but the unfortunate part is unless somebody helps us write off that debt, that is going to be there for the, for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, okay, then, thanks so much, Dean. Um, we might have to end here, if you okay. don't mind. No, that's uh, fine. For time's sake. Okay. Thanks for such an elaborative um, presentation. It's, it looked technical, but you made it so simple. And, and it's, the presentation is so consoling because if we look at what is happening with the scrap and um, the work that the people are doing, I'm so happy that you are recognizing the work that these scrap people are doing. And I'm thinking if we have to create, because we see the cycling track that they have done on our roads, I am so hoping that they would open a track where these guys can pull their trolleys, or I don't know what they call that thing. So all of our, all of what we've done, they can easily take it to the depots for recycling. Definitely scrapping would create lots of opportunities. And I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, Songo, do we have questions? Um, hey, Prof, if, Prof, if you don't, Prof, if you don't mind, can I just finish this one slide in two okay. seconds? Um, okay, because I think this is important. This is a case study of what's happening in the Scandinavian countries. Scandinavian countries now have zero landfill sites across it. All waste material goes through a process, it's collected, it's then burnt, um, and that is then converted into energy, which they heat the water and uh, provide electricity, which is then circulated through all the various country, uh, cities like Stockholm and places like that. The residual material is used as aggregate. And then scan metals basically then captures all of the metal um, that is left in the, uh, the final um, material coming out of uh, the furnaces. Um, and they turn that into various types of metals and residual. And this is where we need, from like a South African perspective and an African perspective to get to, is to get rid of the landfill sites um, and, and get them down to zero. And we need to see this type of uh, business model. That's all I have to say. Thanks so much, Dean. I will share my dream of becoming a Minister of Environment to you. <laughs> no, absolutely. That would be a wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, the floor is open for questions, colleagues. Sango, do we have questions? Sorry, I Dr. have Helen. a comment. Yeah, go ahead. The, the interesting comments, um, I'm picking up in the chat box, but if we can please move on to the next speaker. I'm worried about time, and then we'll then um, wrap it up with, with a Q&A session at the end. Okay, so let me just introduce the next speaker. Um, and that is, um, I'm going there, Cathy Smith, who was appointed Managing Director of South Africa in March 2018. She is the first female head of an emerging market unit in SAP's history. Cathy started her career in the insurance industry as an uh, application developer. She spent three years in the UK consolidating her expertise and held a number of executive roles for European and global markets, specializing in outsourcing services businesses. Welcome Cathy and all the best in your presentation. Uh, fabulous, thank you so much Prof Du. I am really so happy to be here this evening and um, what a fantastic scene was set by about two previous, two previous panelists, really positioning 
uh, both the opportunity and the maturity and the development of the circular economy. Um, like my panelist colleagues, I feel that this is such a critical topic for Africa, particularly in helping us redefine our role globally, as well as on the continent. So tonight I'd like to, I don't have any presentation or slides, so I'm gonna just do a quick talk and I have a, a really interesting video and example that I want to share with you in a few minutes. But tonight I just want to frame my point of view so, um, focused on two key themes. The first is really around the relevance and the opportunity for Africa. So it's our point of view with regard to the circular economy and to sustainability. And then of course, I am absolutely gonna talk about the role of technology in the circular top economy. And um, I've got a really nice example that I'd like to share with everybody. So building on what everybody else had talked about um, it, with regard to the circular economy, According to Gartner, there's a prediction that in the next 10 years, circular, circular economies will absolutely replace linear economies. And these statistics suggest that there is very little, if any, alternative for the developed markets. So for example, China and the United States alone contribute over 40% of the world's CO2 emissions. But I really have spent a lot of time thinking about what does this mean for Africa? And up until a few months ago, I will share with you that I did not appreciate that Africa may have a slightly different context. And I had a really uh, important aha moment um, in a meeting and a discussion I had with one of our large customers on the continent. It was a riveting conversation where they shared a very, very specific and different point of view to what I had had regarding the circular economy. So of course, doing more research and understanding um, was the name of the game. And then, you know, if I expand on that from um, feedback on the 2020 report by the Union of Concerned Scientists, there is a suggestion that African countries today contribute very little, by the way, by way of emissions. In fact, the only country in the top 20 is South Africa. And South Africa accounts for 1% globally in terms of carbon emission contribution. So this does suggest that the situation on our continent may not be as dire as many of the developed markets. So the, I always ask myself, is the notion of a circular economy even relevant in Africa? But based on what I've seen and what I've known, my belief that is even more relevant on our continent than anywhere else. And this is particularly because we see more and more of the pressure mounting globally for more stringent regulations around carbon emissions to stem the tide of, of climate change. One of the things is very possible is that Africa could become an easy target for imposing all of these rules as more developed nations struggle to manage their own carbon footprint and therefore putting us a bit on the back foot. In fact, in the last few weeks, Antonio Guterres, the secretary for the UN, the Secretary General for the UN, he stated categorically that everyone must do their job, whether it's a developing country or a developed country or emerging economies, for us to really make a difference, we've got to work together and all contribute. And it speaks very much to what Kirsten said earlier about this challenge that we have in, our, in the world today will only be solved if we collaborate together. So if we as Africa are unable to meet the requirements around these regulations, our concern is that we will very easily become re relegated to the nations where our value lies purely as a supplier of natural resources for expo export. And then we miss the opportunity for economic prosperity that comes with processing these resources into finished goods. And of course, if you fall into that level, that status, it absolutely will perpetuate the cycle of unemployment, poverty, and of course, associated societal issues. And for us, this is one of the core reasons that the circular economy actually provides Africa with a unique opportunity to get ahead of the curve, to reduce waste emissions, and before we and doing that before we reach critical mass. It is absolutely an opportunity for us to take control of our own destiny, not only for the good of our continent, 
but also for us to cement the, our place in the global economy. So how does technology feature in all of this? Well, as we, we get, to, get to understand more and more, circular economies rely heavily on a high level of transparency and traceability. And this has to be done at every stage of the cycle. And for us, technology holds the absolute key to making this possible and also sustainable. Now, I want to share an example, and it's a project that we're working on in Ghana, and we are partnering with the World Economic Forum, as well as the Global Plastics Action Partnership on a project that will allow for increasing visibility within the plastic supply chain. And our hope is that it will be of benefit to people, companies, and the, and the environment. Now, here's an opportunity for me to show a little bit of a video that will hopefully create a bit of context before I explain a bit more about the project. So we can play the video now. Waste, an unsolvable challenge or part of an infinite loop? A loop bringing everyone together with shared values. Waste collectors in Ghana, recyclers, manufacturers, and brands and citizens around the world. A loop made possible by technology to create a truly circular economy and turn plastic waste into a valuable resource for a sustainable fashion. Creating a seamless value network benefiting all stakeholders, supporting transparency, maximizing the value of each product, ensuring fair payment, an infinite loop that powers circular business models, improving lives today and for future generations. For a better world. With Eon and SAP. So whenever I see that video, it really brings to life for me um, what the power of technology could be um, in solving the problems of sustainability that we have, particularly on our continent. But as a way of background around this project, which we did in Ghana. So I don't know how many of you know, but Ghana generates an estimated 1.1 million tons of plastic waste every year. And only 5% of this plastic is collected for recycling. In addition, they have a large community of waste pickers and they all work incredibly hard to pick plastics for recycling. But they often do this for a very, very um, small payment even though they work so very hard. And the other thing that we found out is that the process of collecting, sorting, reprocessing and reselling the plastic or the recyclable goods is really not very transparent. And this makes it a very inefficient process and absolutely limits the opportunities for innovation. So in this project, we involve more than 2000 Ghanaian pickers we used uh, one of our technology um, platforms called R uh, SAP's Rural Sourcing Management Technology, connected our pickers with aggregators and of course the end manufacturers and at the end of it all the, the consumer. And what we used the technology for was to measure the quantities and type of plastic that the pickers were collecting. This data then got analyzed and matched and also got matched specifically to market-related pricing to make sure that people participating in this um, value chain and particularly the pickers were paid both locally and internationally. So immediately creating a huge amount of transparency and almost empowerment for the different players in the process. Of course, once the plastic was collected, the recycled plastic then got turned into pellets and was spun into yarn to make garments. So already a new product was developed as a result of the, the collection of the plastic. And the technology was used at every point around this, along the supply chain, particularly to trace the product 
to keep really important information, so recording important data. Um, as an example, it was around materials used and even the conditions in the factories where the, where the product was developed and everything store was stored into the cloud. So very accessible at any point in time. But it didn't stop there because once the product got into the consumer's hands, the QR code, and you would have seen it in the video, well, it's put on the label of the, of the garment. And of course the consumer then can check the contents and the history of the garment. And once they no longer wanted it, it could be traded back to the store or the manufacturer and the item can once again be recycled as completing the entire cycle of, of, of the process. Now, for us, it has made a significant difference to all the stakeholders participating. And our ambition and our hope is that eventually it will be rolled out to several other African markets across the continent and addressing, and it, and it will be able to address many issues, not only waste management, but also employment and directly contributing to economic stimulation. So for us, the building of a circular economy must rely heavily on having the technology as well as the digital skills required to support it to become successful. And what's really exciting is that it creates an entirely new category for technology innovation. So jobs for the future that we always talk about is already evolving um, as a result of the circular economy. The opportunity that we see on the continent is specifically related to the youth, to our youth. Do you know that 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25? And this makes Africa the youngest continent. But 60% of Africa's unemployed are youth. So imagine if you combine these two stats together, it absolutely could paint a very grim picture of what the future could be like. But what we like to think about it, think of it of is it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to harness our absolutely greatest assets on our continent, which is our youth. And perhaps we need to really think as corporates because I would represent a corporate in this discussion, but what our key role is in helping stimulate and grow and accelerate the development of the circular economy. For us at SAP, we have a really um, passion, passionate um, position around our purpose, which is to, help the world run better and to improve people's lives. And our approach to sustainability is not one dimensional. We look at it in a twofold manner. In the first instance, we absolutely aim at being the exemplar or role model in our own operation. So, you know, we do in our organization what we say needs to be done in the rest of the world. And the second part of the coin for us is to be the enabler for our customers to become best run companies and to help them maximize efficiency and to have a positive impact on the environment, society, and the economy. So our point of view is that organizations should really steer themselves in a very holistic manner, and that they should not just look at the financial, particularly the top line, but also the social and green bottom lines, because we believe that this leads to better management decisions, and better performing and resilient organizations. We believe that we must make sustainability profitable and profitability sustainable for ourselves undoubtedly, but also for customers and for communities in which we operate. For me, when I think about the circular economy, I really don't view it in one dimension, that of environmental sustainability, uh, that perspective only. What I see is that the circular economy is actually a catalyst for growing digital skills, for driving innovation, for reinventing resilient supply chains, for empowering our youth, and for building a more pros pros prosperous and equitable continent, particularly for now and definitely for the future. I believe that leaders in business and in government must take an active and strategic role in contributing to the economy. But actually, I think the real movement and the power to drive this change 
starts with every one of us as citizens and definitely as consumers. And together, I think that every positive step, step we take towards this change can only do good for our planet and for humanity. So thank you very much um, to the entire VITS Think Tank team for having me. And I really look forward to answering any questions and participating in the remaining discussion. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Kathy. Brilliant. You asked a question and you so brilliant, brilliantly answered it. Thanks for what your company is doing in Ghana. And I would open the floor for questions. Thanks. Hello, do we have questions? questions? I'm not picking up any questions, um, but I do have a question for all the panelists. We've spoken about technology. Okay. We've spoken about the circular economy, what it is. We've also spoken about what industry is doing. And thanks to you, um, Dean. But I want to know now is what do you foresee as being the role of government beyond setting a policy framework in this discussion? Where, where, what is their role like? Songa, are you talking to me, Dean? I'm talking to all three of you. Okay, all right. Okay. Ladies first, or shall I go first? Marianne, Dean. Okay. I think we have to look at South Africa in a very different light um, to the Western economies. Um, the first thing is important is the fact that we have a massive unemployment environment in South Africa, which exceeds 40%. And as Kathy said, you know, Africa's a very young population, average age is about 19. And a significant proportion of that is youth in and, in and around 25 and below. So we have to create jobs and we have to become more entrepreneurial. Um, recently, um, there was a request by the local municipalities to um, get rid of basically the um, informal guys collecting waste. And uh, there was a, um, a, a group that came out in support of uh, the waste pickers. Um, and we actually got rid of that. Um, by getting a number of a significant number of signatures, because I mean these guys do a fantastic job and it creates employment um, as long as they are getting priced in accordingly. Um, so I think government must not look at this as another way of capturing an income into municipalities that uh, are defunct because they've got no more cash, but they should look at ways of trying to increase employment um, and assist wherever possible and make it a little bit easier for these informal settlements. So, you know, that's my personal opinion. Um, I think there's other opportunities in converting various bits of waste collection points and stuff like that that don't exist. And, and government should probably assist in doing that across the board uh, would be my opinion. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Sangha, is there time for another input? Perhaps, perhaps we can hear from, from Kathy as well, what, okay. what she perceives as being the role of government. Okay. I've heard, obviously, the, mm -hmm. the role of technology. I've heard from you with the EPR regulations, and, and it was brilliantly put point. Um, I'd love to hear from Kathy in terms of what she perceives as being the role of government. Yeah, I, I think absolutely it is to put a policy framework together. Um, I think it is undoubtedly to be in partnership with um, private sector as well as um, other supporting um, elements in the entire value chain that puts um, this together, but it's also an enforcer of regulation. I think that would be a critical role that government would have to be playing as well to ensure that um, whatever standards were implemented as part of policy regulation is actually abided by. And then that creates the framework for all of the um, or players in the circular economy to, to operate effectively. I, I think Kirsten wanted to add something in addition. Is that right, Kirsten? Mm. Thanks, Kathy. I think um, as speakers that we still have words at this time is quite fantastic. Um, I would like to add a few more of my own. 
I think um, where we currently sit, and I think the, the material flow analysis demonstrates the very largely linear economy we have in South Africa, and it's, it's probably the, what is the case across the continent. When you have such a linear economy, so the current systems, the policy, regulatory environment, the industrial systems, the way we engage with products as consumers is all set up for a linear economy. So therefore to change that, we do need to change the enabling environment. A circular economy doesn't just evolve um, so-called organically when you're largely locked into a linear economy system. So we do need those policies that regulation and we need integration across different government departments. And I think that's very key. So the circular economy dialogue has largely been driven through our Department of, of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment. We do see the involvement of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Department of Science and Innovation, and there are moves towards integration, but we really need an integrated um, sort of common purpose and vision for our policy and regulatory environment across a number of government departments. Thanks, Songo. Absolutely. I think we've about two minutes left in the session, and I'm going to hand over back to Dr. Helen. I'd just love to hear from each of you just one line in terms of what the circular economy means to you in your personal capacity and how we can take this thing forward. One line. We'll start with you, Kristen. Ah, with me. <laughs> yes. um, so, <laughs> so one line for me. A circular economy means both valuing resources and people. Let's design people into our circular economy. Thank you. Kathy, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, no problem. I, I would say it's um, saving the planet and, and protecting our people. And that's what I would see the circular economy as. I think we need more support from the private sector for doing and and supporting uh, new technology. Um, right now, there's a company that converts CO2 into baking soda um, and then utilizes it and pumps it back into the fluid system to desulfurize. The ability for them to raise funds with something that works and can stop CO2 emissions in anything and create something that can is usable is just one of the most difficult things in the world to do. We don't do that as South Africans. We don't support it. Absolutely. Thanks, Dean. Uh, Professor Helen, before I close off the session, can I also hear from you in terms of what your one line commitment is towards the, the circular economy? Oh, thanks. Um, I would think, um, especially if I have to answer the your first question, what should the government do, actually is to create awareness of what our consumption is doing to the environment and how we are being wasteful. Look at the water shortages. They are quiet until the dams are dry before they inform us to be responsible consumers. So I, would, I really want the government to um, create awareness and I would uh, want the government to take highlights of this presentation and summarize it and play it out before the president makes any speech. <laughs> so with that, I really want to thank Kirsten and, or should I give the, close it now or you have some other things to say? No, absolutely. I think for me, just one line is, it's, it's really creating an inclusive economy. That's what the circular economy is, what it represents to, to me in my life, my business. And, and I hope also to the convocation of, of university of 160,000 people around the world. Just from my side um, to the alumni and to our friends of the alumni, um, next year is 100 years of celebration for this great institution. I implore all those to really participate in the sessions because really it's about creating thought leadership content around what this university is doing and others um, um, around the world. So just to, from my side is just to, once again, yeah, thank all the panelists. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Dean. And thank you to you, Professor Helen. And thanks to Purvi, who hasn't popped up yet, but Purvi was one of the people that organizes excellent panel together. So that's from my side, just thank you to, to everybody and we'll hope to see you in the next um, session. Thank you, Songa. Thank you, everybody. It was lovely being here.
Thanks, Songo. Thanks, Thanks, Songo. Thanks. Thanks, Songo. Thanks, Prof. Helen. Thanks, Burvi. Thank you so Bye. much. Okay. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all our team deals. No problem. Mm. Thanks, it's a wonderful everybody. session. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.